Hey, John here. Let's talk about storage systems, or more specifically, computer memory, of which there are two fundamental types. We have read-only memory, which everyone calls ROM, based on the acronym, okay? And we have RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory, which is a bit of a misnomer because RAM, normally when people say RAM, they're referring to read-write memory. Technically, random access memory means that any of the values stored in the memory can be read in any order without any timing penalty. No matter what I want, in whatever order, I'll get it at the same speed, regardless of the order that I access it. Okay, That's technically what RAM means. But when people say RAM, 99.999% of the time, they really mean read-write memory. I suppose RWM is an acronym that's too hard to say, so people just abuse this one. Ah, eh, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Anyway, what do you use ROM for? It's read-only memory. That means it's not volatile. In other words, the data that's stored in that memory is retained even when the power's off. You turn your machine on, what does it do, right? How does a CPU know what to do when you first turn the power on in your computer? Well, there's a little bit of ROM memory in there that has the instructions in it for it to tell it what to do when it's first powered on because the RAM memory is volatile and it does not have the ability to retain what's stored in there and the power goes off. So your computer starts running by executing code that's in ROM. One way or another, that's what it's going to do. So it should be obvious that uh, you put things like the BIOS in there if it's a PC, well, you can put your entire, all the code in there in, in an embedded system like a microwave oven or a railroad crossing gate control unit or the dashboard controller in your car, right? The last thing you want to do is have, a, you know, a disk failure in your car while you're driving down the highway. Yeah, that would just be no good. So, yeah, the control systems quite oftentimes you'll put all the code in ROM and uh, that way it cannot fail. It's pretty convenient anyway, because I mean, how often do you need to do a firmware update on your microwave oven, right? Hopefully, never. Uh, cars and <laughs> railroad crossing gates, it's pretty important that those always do the same thing all the time, every time, and not have to fail all of a sudden because of a, you know, a, a disk error or something like that. It turns out it's also cheaper to put all your code in ROM, but... You know, the trade-off is you can't change it afterwards, all right? Now, some systems have what we call flash ROM and stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of the two. But in the end, what we're really talking about is is non-volatile memory. That More often than not, it's not something that you can uh, update with any convenience, okay? RAM memory is used for what we call main system memory. You say, oh, my computer has, you know, whatever, 16 gig of RAM in it. You're referring to how much main system memory it has, okay? Now, there's two types of RAM that you can put in, uh, in machines these days, and those are static RAMs and dynamic RAMs. And this is usually pronounced SRAM, and this is usually pronounced DRAM, although some people say DRAM. Static RAMs are built using latches and gates. As a result, uh, it, it runs really fast, but it uses more silicon relative to to dynamic rams okay and therefore it's going to be uh, uh, bigger and therefore it's going to be a, a bit more expensive in terms of the you know square area of the silicon needed to make the static rams all right and that cost adds up pretty quick Dynamic RAMs are built using tiny capacitors. And if you don't know what those are, think of them as little batteries. They don't stay charged very long. Therefore, they're a little slower than static RAM because every now and then you have to refresh the, 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 the data that's stored in a dynamic RAM. And it's fairly often. It's multiple times a second, like four to ten times a second. And it probably depends on the kind of DRAMs that you're using. Okay? However... Because it uses less silicon, it's much cheaper than static RAM. I mean, we're talking like an order of magnitude, if not even more. So in order to save money, 
once again, we complicate things. So let's look at what we call the memory hierarchy. Now, this again, this is all about saving money. Why is it so complicated? When things are complicated, it's because we're trying to save money. Or it's just physically impossible to do it any other way. In this case, it's physically impossible to save up enough money to do an entire system using static RAM at the full speed of the core of the CPU. Probably cost millions of dollars for what would otherwise be a $1,000 PC. So what do we got here? The primary system memory, as opposed to what we'll see down here, a secondary memory, okay? By primary, we're talking about your main memory, essentially, and in, in, in what we call cache and what we call, you know, the registers inside the CPU. So let's look and see what primary system memory really is all about, okay? Now, again, it's fast but expensive, it's always online. In other words, it's always connected to the CPU and it's always ready to go anytime the CPU wants to talk to it and execute a transaction, transfer data back and forth. CPU will directly initiate transfers back and forth between anything that's in the primary system memory. No matter what kind of memory it is, it's generally volatile memory. Now, this is a little bit exa uh, exaggerated because uh, sometimes the primary system memory could include ROM, right? If we, when, when you're executing the BIOS or in a tiny little uh, embedded system, it turns out some of the main system memory could be ROM, okay? But more often than not, the main system memory is volatile. So what types of main system memory are there? Well, we're already familiar with the registers inside the CPU. Today, those are manufactured using static RAM because it runs faster than dynamic RAM. Now, it's really important that the registers run as fast as the CPU itself because the registers are involved in just about every single instruction that the CPU does. And if they're not ready to transfer data, as fast as the CPU can execute instructions, well, then the CPU will have to stall and wait, which is kind of impractical. I suppose by definition, the CPU will have to slow down to the point where its speed matches that of the registers. All right, so no matter how you slice it, this is pretty much true. In modern CPUs, they're always going to be located inside the same chip as the, the ALU and uh, other parts of the CPU. Well, there's another bit of memory that generally sits between the main CPU, its registers, and uh, as we'll see, the main memory down here, which is the bulk of the memory in the machine. And that's called cache. It's generally uh, made with static RAM as well. It too must run as fast as the CPU in order to keep data flowing in and out of the CPU whenever it's needed. Most notably, What's in the cache are the instructions that the CPU needs to execute. They're fetched out of the main memory, as we'll see, and then they're put into the cache, and then the CPU executes them one after another by reading their values out of the cache. Therefore, it has to run as fast as the CPU in order to keep the CPU busy. Quite often, in modern now, nowadays, they're physically located inside the CPU along with the registers. And what it's really for, as I just alluded to, it, it, it's used to keep copies of anything that's been recently used in the main memory. So if you want to read something out of memory, what it does is it keeps a copy of it when the CPU fetches it out of the main memory. It is what we say keeps it closer to the CPU so that the CPU can get to it faster by getting it out of the cache than it could otherwise get it out of the main memory. Which brings us to the main memory. Why is the main memory slower? Because quite often it's built using dynamic RAM. It's not as close to the CPU, all right? Usually it's in separate physical integrated circuits. And there's copper traces that run around on printed circuit cards that connect them to the CPU, but they're kind of far away, relatively speaking, in contrast to things like the cache and registers. And therefore, it takes a little bit more time for the CPU to interact with it. In short, it usually is slower than the main CPU. One could observe that if it is just as fast as the main CPU, we wouldn't need cache, all right? 
Now, there are systems in the old days in particular where we didn't have cache memory. It's because the CPUs ran so slow that the main memory could run just as fast as the CPU. Therefore, the CPU, anytime it needed anything, could get it directly from or put it directly into the main memory. And as we speed up the CPU, we made gains in that part of the system design much faster than we made in designing uh, uh, low-cost main memory. If you want a lot of memory, you buy dynamic RAM. Dynamic RAM runs uh, less than half the speed of the main CPU. Could even be as low as 20% of the speed of the CPU. Okay? So uh, that's why we have this hierarchy. We got the registers. We then have cache, which is some memory. And quite often it's measured in single kilobytes or, or megabytes. It's not gigabytes by any measure, at least today. Main memory these days, like the PC on your desktop, for example, the system that I'm using to record this video has 32 gigs in it. I don't even pay attention to it anymore. But there's no way that those 32 gigs are running anywhere near as fast as the CPU in this system. If it did, it would cost me a small fortune to be able to pay for all that. So we buy a little bit of fast memory. It's implemented in static RAM inside the CPU and a whole lot of a little bit less fast memory to store the bulk of all my programs and data. Now, if we continue to think about memory and storage as we move further and further away from the innards of the CPU, okay, we then move to secondary memory. All right? As, again, it's slower than the primary system memory, but again, it's also cheaper. Now, we, I will observe it's always online, and that is that it's always powered on and connected to the machine. But we start seeing access times that are no longer uniform. Okay, uh, like for this is usually used for things like, uh, as we'll see down here, like flash disks and, and magnetic uh, disk drives and things like that. Okay, so these things take a lot longer to move data in and out of them than the kind of memory that we use in the primary memory. However, it's much less expensive on a per byte basis. I can buy a four terabyte hard drive and put it on my computer for the same price as I can buy like 16 gigabytes of, of main uh, DRAM memory, okay? So just to give you a, a hint of the, of the cost savings here, right? So as we move further and further away from the CPU itself, we tend to tolerate slower memories, provided that they continue to get cheaper and cheaper. What's this trade-off? Again, money versus the performance. Now, it wouldn't be too useful if secondary memory was itself volatile, right? So we tend to use these to store our files and stuff like that on them, right? So these, these are non-volatile systems. They're rewritable, but they're not volatile. And like I said, these tend to be things like solid-state disks or you know magnetic disks. The next step as we move further away from the CPU is offline memory. This is super slow, increasingly slow, 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 but it's also super duper 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 cheap. Part of the speed of it being slow is that it is not online all the time. Okay, again, it's not volatile. If it's not online, it suggests it's powered off. It would be of little value if it was volatile. Okay, these are your USB drives or like a, a jukebox that's filled with optical disks or magnetic tapes, kind of a thing. All right, and these things tend to have incredibly wildly differing access times. Right. Now, how long does it take to get a USB flash drive plugged into your PC, right? Well, you know, we're relying on a person to plug that thing in. Or in a jukebox case, you might have a robotic arm or something that, that has a, a shelf filled with a bunch of uh, tapes or uh, discs or something like that, and it grabs one and puts it in a player so that the, uh, the computer can read and write its data, okay? But there is another note down here. These drives, a USB flash, and even a lot of the jukeboxes that are out there these days, 
These can, once they're connected, quite often run just about as fast as these solid state disk drives. So you can get a quick, uh, good, good, good bang for the buck out of these uh, modern flash drives, okay? So what are some of the observations we can make at this point? If you write a function, it would be best to try to optimize the use of the registers in blocks of code like the body of a, of a loop or something like that. Registers are the fastest thing in the whole machine. Now, when the registers can't contain all the data that you need all at the same time, say in a body of a loop or something like that, you have to then spill the register of data into the cache, we say. And sometimes even the cache can't hold as much as you might be generating. And then you have to spill it all the way into the main memory, right? So your program will run increasingly slower when it needs more resources than you have in the registers and the cache. And if you overdo the main memory, you then have to spill from the memory into the disk. And again, slower and slower and slower as you go. Now, I'll note that when you exchange data between the cache and the main system memory, on modern systems, it's transferred in these small blocks between 16 and 128 bytes at a whack. All right? Those blocks are what we call a cache line. On all modern PCs, it's pretty much 64 bytes for one cache line. So if you want to read one byte out of memory, what really happens is you have to pay the full tax of reading 64 bytes of memory into the cache so that the CPU can cherry pick that one little byte out of there. But large, cheap, dynamic RAMs these days are built and optimized very specifically to move chunks of 64 bytes back and forth. So that's not as bad as it might otherwise seem. Now let's define a few things related to what we call locality of reference. We've got temporal and we have spatial. Now, uh, temporally, what we're talking about are data items that might tend to be used again in the near future. For example, the instructions in a loop that iterates a million times. Every instruction in that loop, by definition, would be, have to be read fetched out of the memory or the cache a million times over and over and over and over again. So that kind of activity is usually called a temporal reference. The, the uh, same thing being used over and over again in the near future. If the instructions can be read from memory and stored in the cache without overflowing the cache, well, once they're all in the cache, the CPU can run full speed over and over and over again in that loop. Another kind of temporal reference might be, uh, say, the counter in a loop. Right? You say for x equals 0 to a million, and then you do something, right? Well, every time through that loop, you got to read the value of x, add 1 to it, and then store it back in the variable for x. Like, now, it'd be nice if that was stored in a register that whole time, but if you need to use all the registers for the body of your loop, you might have to write it back into the cache or into the main memory. But nonetheless, what we're really doing there is talking about the uh, fact that something gets used over and over again. Now, there's another kind of reference called spatial. Now, again, we're talking about instructions in a loop, but this is a little bit different, okay? Let's look at the array example more closely here. If we have an array and we want to add up all the elements in an array, what we're really doing, if you add them up in order from, you know, element zero plus element one plus element two and so on in that order, what happens is the program reads one element after another in adjacent memory addresses. They're physically, in terms of memory addresses, very close to each other. Now remember what I told you about the cache up here and the fact that DRAMs are designed to transfer cache size blocks of data, which on your PC is 64 bytes. Same probably on your phone, too. Well, if you have an array of integers, and an integer is 4 bytes each, That means you can put 16 integers in one cache line. 
So when you read the first element of an array in this example, it's really going to read 16 of them. So the CPU can add those first 16 up by only accessing the cache once the first cache line has been loaded out of the main memory. And in a really good system, what can happen is the cache can start loading the second line of the next 16 elements before the CPU even finishes reading the first 16. Now those optimizations require uh, a deeper understanding and complicated hardware, but such systems do exist. Now, the example here, when we talk about instructions in a loop, when we're talking about spatial locality of reference, what we're doing here is we're making the observation that not the same instruction gets executed over and over again. We're going to observe that one instruction after another is fetched in order in increasing memory addresses, okay? Just like the array elements were. Suppose I should change this handout and remove the loop comment here because this is true about all instructions that are racing through memory. We call that a march, okay? A memory march as you're just going one after another after another in order. If you're going to execute a, a series of instructions and never branch, that's what you're doing is marching through memory. And it's the same thing as if you're adding all these elements of an array together. So it would be nice if the CPU would read ahead and make these big chunks of data available to the CPU so that most of the time the data that it needs is in the cache and immediately ready when the CPU wants to read it. Now, oh, things start getting nice and complicated. Whenever you have a data type that's represented using multiple bytes, it would be very nice if that data element was stored in memory such that it was aligned so that when the CPU needs it and it fetches it out of the memory, it's stored in an address that maps cleanly into one cache line or part of a single cache line. In other words, let's say I want to read an integer, a four-byte integer. It'd be very nice that the first byte was on the same cache line as the second, third, and fourth. Otherwise, this, the cache would have to fetch two whole lines before it even got one value. Okay? This is one of the reasons some systems don't even allow you to misalign data type. Cache lines are aligned in a lot of times integers and floating point numbers and double precision floats and all of its native data types quite often are aligned. Systems that provide you the ability to read and write data that's not aligned do exist, but they do not run as fast. They run noticeably slower. So one simple optimization when you're writing a program is to make sure that when your, your variables are stored in memory, that they're all aligned to what we call a natural boundary so that when they're moved in and out of the caches, that it happens at one operation, one block, rather than many, okay? Now we can extend that, like in the array example. If you have multiple data variables that are used in groups, like elements of an array that you're going to go and add together, or all the elements that comprise a structure or a class, all the member variables in there. You can tell the compiler to optimize certain things and place them in memory such that the elements in a class or a structure can all end up on one cache line. And if you think about it, if you have a structure of some kind that's 64 bytes in size, and your cache lines are 64 bytes in size, and every time you execute a function in your class, that you need to access all of those 64 bytes for whatever reason, the best scenario could be that that thing fits exactly into one cache line. And for that to happen, and we'll talk about caches at some other time, but the short of it is the cache lines always have to uh, uh, align themselves 
on your PC, for example, if it has a 64-byte line of cache, then that has to be on a multiple of 64 for its address. The first byte in that line has to start in an address that's a multiple of 64. And given all this uh, scenario that I'm talking about here, you would like to tell the compiler to place your 64-byte objects into memory so that the address of the first byte in that structure or class starts at an address that's a multiple of 64. Let's consider a few examples here. Let's say I got a single instruction, single data machine. You're writing a program, a regular old program. It's got a single thread. It's just going to execute some code. Now, hopefully it's obvious that if you have a system that has a 4K byte cache, this is really small, but I made it small to, ex to uh, exacerbate the issue that I'm going to illustrate in this example here. And let's say it has its uh, cache lines are each 64 bytes long, okay? How then should you implement a function that's going to have to read 10,000 elements of a 32-bit integer array? You want to read them all one at a time. Which one of these three options is going to run fastest? Do you want to read them all in order, starting at element 0 through the last one? Do you want to read them in random order, or do you want to read them in order from 0 to n, doing all the even ones first, and then go back and do all the odd ones? Well, it turns out simpler is better in this example. But why? Specifically, why? All right, think about it. If your cache can only hold 4K total and you need to go through a 10,000 element array whose elements are each four bytes, that's 40K. So you need to read in 10 times more data from the main memory than you can fit in your cache. Well, if you read them in order from zero to N, what will happen is it'll do what I discussed earlier when you're adding up elements, for example, from an array. It'll read in 16 elements at a time from the main memory. The main CPU then will add up or hand read or process or whatever it's going to do to those 16 elements, all right? When it gets to the 17th one and starts processing that, the system's going to have to go out to the main memory and read in another 16 elements so that those can be read by the CPU. And if you're reading them in order from zero on up, what happens is once you finish the cache using the cache line for the first 16 elements, you're not going to need it again. And that's the key when your cache is not as big as the total amount of elements, the total amount of bytes, I should say, that you want to read out of the main memory. Okay? So what's going to happen is it'll march through memory one cache line at a time. Eventually, the cache will become full, and here's the problem. Once you've read in 4K total data and you're marching along in memory and you say, I want another one, I want another one, and keep adding, the cache is going to have to discard a line to make room for the new ones that you're reading in. Now, there's all kinds of heuristics and things that could be applied. One common way to do this is to throw away the cache line that is the least recently used data. So as you start filling in your cache, it keeps the most recent ones around and throws away the older ones. Now, we don't care so much how it decides because when we've added up the 16 elements of each one of the cache lines, we don't need them anymore if we use this approach here. So it really doesn't matter which cache line's thrown away when a new memory read is uh, scheduled to take place to fill another cache line. Once we're done with it, we're done with it, okay? Well, the CPU will go out and read in another cache line, then add up those 16 maybe, read another cache line, add up those 16, All right? Now, if you do this in random order, what's going to happen is... Uh, 
you know, well, random means random, so you don't really know for sure. But, you know, uh, it, what would happen is, uh, given the huge amount of elements, the 10 to 1 more bytes of memory than you have in the cache size, then statistically, if you process them in random order, you know, the chance that you're going to read all those 16 elements on one line before you go on to another one is pretty low, okay? So in the end, you're going to be reading in a cache line using some of it and most likely throw it away before you go back and read the other elements that are on that cache line. Therefore, taxing the CPU to make it read data from the main memory over and over again more than it should if you do this in a more organized manner. Let's look and see what happens down here. If you read all of the elements from beginning to end and you process all the even ones, then you go back to the beginning of the array and go back and process all the odd ones. What happens in that scenario? Well, when you get the first one, you're going to read in 16 because that's what fits on the one cache line. And then by definition, you're going to process half of those elements. Then you'll go on to the second uh, cache line that'll get filled up. And you'll use and process half of the elements in that line and so on. Now, by the time you get done with all the even elements, because I said there's 10,000 of them, you would have had to read in all 10,000 elements into the cache because it has to read in 64 bytes at a whack. You just processed only half of them. So it's going to have to read them all in twice is what it's going to have to do. This one will work better probably than the random one, but this one up here, A, is your optimum choice. Given a small cache, a large amount of data, and the fact that you're only going to do one thing at a time. Okay, what if you have a single instruction with multiple data kind of a machine? Now, to keep this simple, let's just assume that you have two threads running. Okay, so uh, the way this works is both of these threads are doing the same thing at the same time. They both execute the same instructions while the machine runs, but one thread can use a different data element than the other thread. And let's say you want to add up all the values of, of the same scenario, okay? But you're going to do it with a SIMD machine. Well, how would you do it in this scenario? Would you want to read in the first half of the elements using one thread and the second half of all the elements using the other thread? Or would you want one thread to do the even ones and one thread to do the odd ones? Well, in this case you got a very different situation on your hands because you've got a multiple data machine. Now, if you use option A up here, now keep in mind, in a SIMD machine, both of these threads are executing the same operation at the same time. But they're doing it with different data. So think about what happens when you interact with a cache in this scenario. If this thread reads in all and processes all the, the the first half of all the elements, and you only got a 4K cache, well, this thread down here is doing the second half of all the elements. These two things are going to contend for that cache. So when this one's trying to read in the first line of data so it can start going, this one's going to be trying to read in another line that starts halfway through the data array so it can start going. And as soon as they get going again, they'll constantly be trying to read in different cache lines the whole way through. If you do it this way down here, what happens is both of these threads are really trying to get at the same cache line at the same time. That will run faster if they're using the same cache, okay? So they're both going to ask, I need the first cache line to be loaded from the same elements in the array. Well, one thread does the even ones and the other thread does the odd ones, but they're both starting at 
or near, we should say, the beginning of the array, okay? So this will do eight elements from the same cache line that this will be doing its eight elements from, all at the same time. And as soon as thread zero starts to move to the second cache line that it needs to be loaded, this thread down here will also move to the exact same new cache line that will need to be loaded. This will probably run faster than this. In fact, if you go over to NVIDIA and you look up on a GPU, what's the best way? This is usually called a reduction. You want to you know, sum up a bunch of things using multiple threads. What, which one runs faster? Hands down, B will run faster than A up here. Now, that, of course, perhaps defend, depend on the kind of GPU you have, but uh, quite often, as has been the case for the last decade, uh, they, uh, they tend to share a cache, and they share a lot of memory. And therefore, this one here will run faster. One last side observation. Keep in mind that the same basic logic... And we just talked about regarding the cache and the main memory and how to use it and what order to read it. That's going on with your disk drive, too. The operating systems usually create a cache for the blocks of data that are stored on a disk drive. Yes, your Unix, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, whatever, all of them do this. And if you're going to build a large database application or something these kind of decisions may come into play when you think about how you want to deal with accessing the data in files that come off a disk. So what's the takeaway here? This general logic can be applied at all levels from the main memory to how you deal with disks and disk I.O. all the way up and down in the and what we refer to as the memory hierarchy. All right? Thanks for watching.